right friends welcome back to main events of third week from 18th january to 24th january and let us look at the highlights india reduces carbon emission intensity by 12% in 5 years all of you are well aware as per the indc submitted by india to unfccc india has to reduce 33 to 35% of carbon emissions per unit of gdp by 2030 and india stated within first 5 years of 2005 to 10 india already reduced by 12% union cabinet approves major changes to power tariff policy if any taxes are imposed subsequent to the agreement then that has to be passed on to the subscribers that is the major change center declassifies 100 files of netaji subhash chandra bose on his birth anniversary on 23rd january isro launches a fifth gps satellite two more are left over and once seven series is completed then we can expect navigation system just like gps in our country look into the next one unfortunate incident of suicide of rohit vemula created lot of animosity and concern across the country national family health survey four results were released for some states and two union territories then scheduled caste and scheduled tribes prevention of atrocities amendment act 2015 came into force from 26th january 2016 next important issue is nepal amends the constitution but madhesis are somehow not happy they want separate provinces in madhesi dominated areas attack on bacha khan university is the dual policy in pakistan of encouraging terrorism across the border is creating damage to its own country then norms liberalized for gold monetization scheme because it is felt that banks are not taking much interest then macro economic indicators from china shows that china has grown by the slowest 6.9% in 25 years and it is expected to grow at much lesser pace of 6.3 and 6% in the subsequent years Look into the first issue India reduces carbon emission intensity by 12% in 5 years India just like other countries has submitted intended nationally determined contributions or popularly known as INDCs submitted to UNFCCC UNFCCC is United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change India submitted its contributions intended contributions to UNFCCC on October 2nd subsequently Paris summit was held that is popularly climate summit that is a COP21 summit and as per COP21 summit developing countries have to submit biennial update reports once in 2 years biennial means once in 2 years please don't confuse between biennial and biannual biennial is once in 2 years biannual means once in 6 months there is lot of difference between these two terms as per this climate summit or cop 21 each and every country has to submit their reports once in 2 years that means to see whether the intended contributions are being implemented or not and india submitted its first biennial update report and there is a slight difference when developing country is submitting that is called a biennial update report when developed country is submitting that is called biennial report and india submitted its first report and in the report india stated that india reduced carbon emission intensity per unit of gdp by 12% within 5 years that means the program is started on 2005 because as per indcs submitted by india india is expected to reduce carbon emission intensity by 33 to 35% by 2030 in comparison to 2005 levels and now in its report india submitted that within first 5 years 
out of 25 years the total time period is 2005 to 2030 it is 25 years out of 25 years during the first 5 years india reduced carbon emission intensity by 12% so it is a substantial when you look at 33 to 35 percent is the overall target that is emissions per unit of GDP as per INDC submitted by India are 33 to 35 percent out of which India already reduced 12 percent which is a substantial if you look at India's commitment then India emitted 2.136 billion tons of CO2 equivalent and please do not forget all the greenhouse gases are calculated in terms of carbon dioxide equivalent and India's emissions are 2.136 billion tons of carbon dioxide equivalent in 2010 and it comes to 1.56 tons of carbon dioxide per capita. India's emissions comes to 1.56 tons of CO2 per capita and it is almost one third of the world average. World as an average each person is contributing 4.5 around 4 and half tons of carbon dioxide emissions and India contributes to just 1.56 tons of carbon dioxide emissions in the year 2010. And two things please do not forget China is the largest carbon dioxide emissions in the world that is China is the largest greenhouse gas emitter in the world and if you look at per capita per each person United States of America stand at first position right total emissions China highest per capita emissions United States of America is the highest and India emits just one third of the world average. So, it clearly tells a point lot more needs to be done in India to alleviate poverty to bring the masses out of poverty line but clearly India's intention is the future energy requirements will be met through renewable energy like solar energy, wind energy as India stated that by 2022 175 gigawatt of energy needs will be met through renewable energy sources. And if you look at contributors of carbon emissions in India that is 71 percent comes from energy sector, 18 percent comes from agriculture sector that is as per the report submitted by India to UNFCCC. Union cabinet approves major changes to power tariff policy. What is the need for it? Power tariff policy previous one was in 2006 that means previous power tariff policy document pertains to 2006 and it is basically creating problem because when states are imposing any taxes, cesses or levies, power companies are not able to pass it on to the customers as per power tariff policy of 2006. Now that ambiguity is removed, now power companies are allowed to pass costs on to the consumers arising out of any changes in taxes, cesses and levies levied on them. That means, if any new tax or if any cess is levied on the power company, then they can pass on it to consumer. So, this redundancy of previous power tariff policy of 2006 was removed. That means, the ambiguity was removed. Second thing is, power generating companies can sell their surplus power to the power exchange and share the proceeds with the state government. And another important point is power to be provided to remote unconnected villages through microgrids with the provision for purchase of power into the grid as and when grid reaches there. Several interior areas are without power grid. So, the power policy says that go ahead with microgrids as and when our grid connectivity reaches those hinterlands, we will purchase from you. Fourth important point is under renewable generation obligation, this power generation companies established based on coal or lignite have to establish, procure or purchase renewable capacity. That means, so as to shift gradually from coal based power generation to renewable energy based. 
end. Another important point is under renewable power obligation, 8 percent of electricity consumption excluding hydropower shall be from solar energy by March 22. So, these are important changes made to power tariff policy which was announced by the power minister Piyush Goyal recently. If you look at other major cabinet decisions, rupees 5000 crore of viability gap funding for 5000 megawatt of grid connected solar projects. For grid connected solar projects, viability gap funding. What is viability gap funding? When a project is constructed, then if it is not viable financially, if a highway is to be constructed connecting Gauhati in Assam to Imphal in Manipur, then it may not be financially viable because the traffic expected may be less. It is due to strategic reasons. Under those circumstances, government will support that project. Similarly, for establishing this solar projects, grid connected solar projects, they may not be financially viable for that government is supporting with funding that is viability gap funding. So, government is supporting with rupees 5050 crore viability gap funding for 5000 megawatt of grid connected solar projects. Second important point is post facto approval was given for the stance taken by India at 10th ministerial meeting of WTO at Nairobi. Third important point is market development assistance of rupees 1500 per ton on city compost. What is the city compost? City compost is developed out of the garbage of a city and city garbage will be converted to compost and so as to make it financially viable. 1500 rupees per ton of market development assistance will be given and this will ensure proper nutrients will go to the soil and at the same time it will keep the city clean and at the same time it will require less filling spaces in already congested cities. Right. So, 1500 rupees of market development assistance per ton of city compost will be given. Look into the next one. Center declassifies 100 files of Netaji Subhash Chandra Bose. Subhash Chandra Bose was born on 23rd January 1897 in Katak in present day Odisha and he was suspected to have died in 1945 in plane crash in Taiwan. But there are reports that he survived that plane crash and as per the Official Secrets Act of 1923, files can be kept secret, but recently government declassified 100 files. You may ask a question why the files were kept secret for so many years. Government states that it may result in the relations with other countries may be affected because of that government kept the files secret for the past several years and last year West Bengal government declassified 64 files and now government of India declassified 100 files and the Prime Minister declassified at the National Archives of India and this declassification may not put an end to the theory that Netaji lived subsequent to 1945. Look at the next one, ISRO launches fifth GPS satellite, this is IRNSS-1E. This is fifth in the series of Indian Regional Navigation Satellite System. This is fifth in the series of IRNSS. This is 1425 kg satellite taken off from Satish Dhawan Space Center at Sri Harikota. And what is the purpose of it? The purpose is to provide accurate position information system. It gives accurate position or accurate navigation. So far we are using GPS. GPS belongs to United States of America and two more in the series are to be launched. With the launch of two more, the entire seven will be completed. Once these seven are completed, then we will have our own navigation system. And it may have some constraints, I am not going into those details, but it is the step in the direction of having our own navigation system. But two more in the series of IRNSS are required to be launched by Sri Harikota Space Center. Look into the next one, 
unfortunate suicide of Rohit Vemula created panic across the country, especially in the educational institutions. But two pertinent questions are evident. First and the foremost is, are the educational institutions functioning with the core tenets of independence and autonomy? In our country, unfortunately, there will be excessive pressure from the ministry on educational institutions for trivial issues also. So, independence and autonomy, which are the hallmarks of education system in United States of America and other advanced countries, is the need of the hour. Second most important point is, whatever the incident happens, it should not be excessively politicized. Third important point is, caste is playing havoc in universities and colleges. And how to keep the name of caste confidential in educational institutions? That is the need of the hour. These things Indian parliament need to debate in clearer terms and the present situation should not be allowed to deteriorate further. Right friends, look into the next one. National Family Health Survey was for the first time held in 1992-93 and previous health survey was held in 2005-06 and this is the fourth National Family Health Survey and now figures are available for comparison purpose after 10 years. Now the data is available for 13 states and 2 union territories. Complete data will be made available by September 2016. And I have given some pertinent points of National Family Health Survey. First and the foremost point is stunted children below the age of 5 reduced by around 5% from 42% to 37%. What is the meaning of stunted children? That means stunted children are the children who couldn't have proper growth and the growth normally expected for five-year child, if they are not able to attain that growth, that is known as the stunting. So, stunted children below the age of five reduced by 5% from 42% to 37% and Bihar and Madhya Pradesh are worst affected with 48 and 42%, that means above the national average. Then underweight children below the age of 5, this is also reduced by 5% from 39% to 34%. But here also Bihar and Madhya Pradesh are worst affected. Then third important point is marked improvement in literacy rates. If you look at the literacy rates of women in the age group of 15 to 49, it increased substantially by around 15% in low literacy states like Bihar. In Bihar, it increased from 37% to 50%, Haryana 60 to 75%, then Madhya Pradesh from 44 to 59%. So, some North Indian states which have low women literacy rates have shown substantial improvement in women literacy. That is one good point. And fourth important point is marriageable age also increased substantially and for the women in 20 to 24 age group who are married before 18 years came down substantially in Bihar, Haryana and Madhya Pradesh. That means the marriageable age is gradually increasing and it came down from 60 percent to 39 percent in Bihar, 40 percent to 19 percent in Haryana, 53 percent to 30 percent in Madhya Pradesh. So, these are the important indicators which were evident from National Family Health Survey. If you want some more points, I have given here, but unfortunate aspect is 82 percentage of women and 70 percent of men reported that they lack comprehensive knowledge of HIV and AIDS. That means a lot more needs to be done with regard to educating the people with regard to HIV and AIDS. Right, friends? Scheduled Cash and Scheduled Tribes Prevention of Atrocities Amendment Act 2015 was came into force from 26th January 2016 and the original act of atrocities on SCs and STs pertained to 1989. Now amendments are made, certain things were brought here. One is if tonsuring of head 
or similar acts which are derogatory to the dignity of SCs and STs are brought under the purview of this act. Similarly, garlanding with chapels, using or permitting manual scavenging. This is very important because manual scavenging is still prevalent in some places of states like Uttar Pradesh then abusing in caste name, then imposing social or economic boycott. These things were brought under the purview of atrocities on scheduled castes and scheduled tribes act of 2015. And for expeditious disposal of cases, exclusive special courts will be established. And for public servants, it also defined willful negligence and dereliction of duty. Some cases, some of the public servants were attributed with willful negligence. Now, this is also defined under this act. If you look at the events around the world, Nepal amends the constitution. The constitution of Nepal came into existence on September 20 and now it amended the constitution so as to satisfy the demands of Madhesis who are of Indian origin living in Terai region of Nepal. Here the changes made include proportional representation and more inclusive social justice to the groups then allocation of parliamentary seats on the basis of population. These three changes were brought, but Madhesis are not happy because they want creation of two provinces for Madhesi people on 1200 kilometers long southern plains of Nepal bordering India. And they want two specific provinces for Madhesis because under the present arrangement, Madhesis will be distributed among various provinces and they feel that their voice will be lost if they are spread into various provinces. That is the main demand which could not be satisfied through the amendments to the constitution. Attack on Bacha Khan University in Pakistan, it raises four pertinent questions. First one is, Address the issue of poverty and lawlessness in Northwest Frontier Province, popularly known as Khyber Fakhtunkhwa Province. There, poverty and lawlessness are prevalent, and it is the breeding ground for several terrorist organizations which are working not only in Pakistan but also in Afghanistan. So, poverty and lawlessness is to be curbed first. Second important point is Pakistan wants to control TTP that is Pakistani Taliban. At the same time, there are news reports, they are encouraging Afghan Taliban across the border and at the same time lashkar e toiba and jaish e Muhammad across the border towards India. So, the dual policy of controlling Pakistani Taliban and encouraging terrorists across the border will definitely cause further harm to the country that Pakistan should realize at the first instance. Third important point is there should be better coordination between civilian government and army which is clearly missing in Pakistan. And the fourth one is there should be a comprehensive strategy to deal with the terrorism by inviting regional powers because to control terrorism, a comprehensive action plan of various countries is a must. One country cannot deal terrorism in isolation and regional powers like India, Pakistan, Afghanistan, they should be involved. If at all, Pakistan has got a seriousness of controlling terrorism, right? So, these four pertinent points comes to my mind after the Bacha Khan University, which led to the loss of around 20 to 30 lives in terrorist attack. Right friends, look into the next one, economy and banking. Norms liberalized for gold monetization scheme. Government of India brought three schemes, all of you are well aware. One is gold monetization scheme, which is not successful. Sovereign gold bond scheme, it is successful to some extent. 
and it is bringing india gold coin and the aim of this gold monetization scheme and gold bond scheme is basically to reduce imports we are the largest consumer of gold in the world around 900 tons of gold is imported into the country and precious foreign exchange is paid because of gold imports which is non essential import keeping that in view government of india brought this gold monetization scheme but banks are not showing much interest and recently they brought some changes one is it allowed premature redemption for medium term gold deposits and long term gold deposits it allowed premature redemption that means lock in period is reduced that is medium term gold deposits the lock in period is 3 years and long term gold deposits the lock in period is 5 years we discussed in detail in previous classes what is medium term what is long term please listen to those lectures this medium term and long term gold deposits are accepted on behalf of central government by the banks and here lock in period will be 3 years and 5 years and quantity is to be expressed up to 3 decimal places of gram because of cost involved the quantity of gold is to be expressed up to 3 decimal points of gram that is second important point third one is now the gold can be directly deposited with the refiner itself previously as per the original instructions it was stated that this gold has to come through collection and purity testing centers now government came up with the stipulation that the gold can be directly deposited with refiner and the last one is the commission paid to banks is increased to 2.5% on medium term and long term gold deposits let us hope these things may bring in some gold under gold monetization scheme Look at the last one macroeconomic indicators from China panic across the world China is growing at 6.9% in 2015 the growth rate of 6.9% is the slowest in 25 years and at the same time during 2016 it is expected to grow at 6.3% during 2017 it is expected to grow at 6% and stock prices contracted 50% from the levels of may june 2015 and capital flight of around 600 billion dollars took place during the past 6 months what is capital flight foreigners withdrawing money from the stock markets is capital flight capital is flowing out of the country that means the confidence of foreign investors on china was decreasing or diminishing then because of economic downturn millions of houses are lying vacant fall in housing prices fall in stock prices which may lead to some bankruptcies in future some of the companies may file application for bankruptcy then china is already suffering from excess capacity excess capacity is created especially in steel industry and the growth model so far is based on exports and competitive wages china has grown for the past 30 years based on competitive wages that means the wages in china are one of the lowest in the world because of low wages because of the proactive policies of the government several foreign investors invested in china so china is example of low wage model as well as export led economy but now it is transitioning to services led consumption led innovation based economy and this is the transition and how china will overcome this transition it is the million dollar question we have to wait and see how china will ensure smooth transition from low wages export led model economy to innovation services and consumption led economy now china is betting on its own consumption and because of which the chinese economy is not growing on the expected lines and we have to wait and see how china will overcome these many problems in near future right with this let us conclude the lecture part of third week and have a nice day thank you